Chapter One of Celebrated Crimes, Volume Six, Part One, Joan of Naples. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Crimes, Volume Six, Part One, Joan of Naples by Alexandre Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. Chapter One. In the night of the fifteenth of January, thirteen forty-three while the inhabitants of naples lay wrapped in peaceful slumber they were suddenly awakened by the bells of the three hundred churches that this thrice blessed capital contains in the midst of the disturbance caused by so rude a call the first thought in the mind of all was that the town was on fire or that the army of some enemy had mysteriously landed under the cover of night and could put the citizens to the edge of the sword but the doleful intermittent sounds of all these fills which disturbed the silence at regular and distant intervals were an invitation to the faithful to pray for a passing soul it was soon evident that no disaster threatened the town but that the king alone was in danger indeed it had been plain for several days past that the greatest uneasiness prevailed in castel nuovo the officers of the crown were assembled regularly twice a day and persons of importance whose right it was to make their way into the king's apartments came out evidently bowed down with grief but although the king's death was regarded as a misfortune that nothing could avert yet the whole town on learning for certain of the approach of his last hour was affected with a sincere grief easily understood when one learns that the man about to die after a reign of thirty-three years eight months and a few days was robert of anjou the most wise, just, and glorious king who had ever sat on the throne of Sicily, and so he carried with him to the tomb the eulogies and regrets of all his subjects. Soldiers would speak with enthusiasm of the long wars he had waged with Frederick and Peter of Aragon, against Henry the Seventh and Louis of Bavaria, and felt their hearts beat high, remembering the glories of campaigns in Lombardy and Tuscany. Priests would gratefully extol his constant defense of the papacy against Ghibelline attacks and the founding of convents, hospitals, and churches throughout his kingdom. In the world of letters he was regarded as the most learned king in Christendom. Petrarch, indeed, would receive the poet's crown from no other hand, and had spent three consecutive days answering all the questions that Robert had deigned to ask him on every topic of human knowledge. The men of law, astonished by the wisdom of those laws which now enriched the Neapolitan Code, had dubbed him the Solomon of their day. The nobles applauded him for protecting their ancient privileges, and the people were eloquent of his clemency, piety, and mildness. In a word, priests and soldiers, philosophers and poets, nobles and peasants trembled when they thought that the government was to fall into the hands of a foreigner and of a young girl, recalling those words of Robert, who, as he followed in the funeral train of Charles, his only son, turned as he reached the threshold of the church, and sobbingly exclaimed to his barons about him, "'This day the crown has fallen from my head! Alas for me! Alas for you!' Now that the bells were ringing for the dying moments of the good king, every mind was full of these prophetic words. Women prayed fervently to God. Men from all parts of the town bent their steps toward the royal palace to get the earliest and most authentic news and after waiting some moments, passed in exchanging sad reflections, were obliged to return as they had come, since nothing that went on in the privacy of the family found its way outside. The castle was plunged in complete darkness, the drawbridge was raised as usual, and the guards were at their post. Yet if our readers care to be present at the death of the nephew of St. Louis and the grandson of Charles of Anjou, we may conduct them into the chamber of the dying man." An alabaster lamp suspended from the ceiling serves to light the vast and sombre room, with walls draped in black velvet sewn with golden fleur-de-lis. Near the wall, which faces the two entrance doors that at this moment are both shut close, there stands beneath a brocaded canopy an ebony bed, supported on four twisted columns carved with symbolic figures. The king, after a struggle with a violent paroxysm, has fallen swooning in the arms of his confessor and his doctor, who each hold one of his dying hands, feeling his pulse anxiously and exchanging looks of intelligence. At the foot of the bed stands a woman about fifty years of age, her hands clasped, her eyes raised to heaven in an attitude of resigned grief. This woman is the queen. No tears dim her eyes. 
her sunken cheek has that waxen yellow tinge that one sees on the bodies of saints preserved by miracle in her look is that mingling of calm and suffering that points to a soul at once tried by sorrow and imbued with religion after the lapse of an hour while no movement had disturbed the profound silence which reigned about the bed of death the king trembled slightly opened his eyes and endeavored feebly to raise his head they thanking the physician and priest with a smile who had both hastened to arrange his pillows he begged the queen to come near and told her in a low voice that he would speak with her a moment alone the doctor and confessor retired deeply bowing and the king followed them with his eyes up to the moment when one of the doors closed behind them he passed his hand across his brow as though seeking to collect his thoughts and rallying all his forces for the supreme effort pronounced these words what i must say to you sancha has no concern with those two good persons who were here a moment ago their task is ended one has done all for my body that human science could teach him and all that has come of it is that my death is yet a little deferred the other has now absolved me of all my sins and assured me of god's forgiveness yet cannot keep from me those dread apparitions which in this terrible hour arise before me twice have you seen me battling with a superhuman horror my brow has been bathed in sweat my limbs rigid my cries have been stifled by a hand of iron has god permitted the evil spirit to tempt me is this remorse in phantom shape these two conflicts i have suffered have so subdued my strength that i can never endure a third listen then my sandra for i have instructions to give you on which perhaps the safety of my soul depends my lord and my master said the queen in the most gentle accents of submission i am ready to listen to your orders and should it be that god in the hidden designs of his providence has willed to call you to his glory while we are plunged in grief your last wishes shall be fulfilled here on earth most scrupulously and exactly but she added with all the solicitude of a timid soul pray suffer me to sprinkle drops of holy water and banish the accursed one from this chamber and let me offer up some part of that service of prayer that you composed in honour of your sainted brother to implore god's protection in this hour when we can ill afford to lose it then opening a richly bound book she read with fervent devotion certain verses of the office that robert had written in a very pure latin for his brother louis bishop of toulouse which was in use in the church as late as the time of the council of trent soothed by the charm of the prayers he had himself composed the king was near forgetting the object of the interview he had so solemnly and eagerly demanded and letting himself lapse into a state of vague melancholy he murmured in a subdued voice yes yes you are right pray for me for you too are a saint and i am but a poor sinful man say not so my lord interrupted donna sancha you are the greatest wisest and most just king who has ever sat upon the throne of naples but the throne is usurped replied robert in a voice of gloom you know that the kingdom belonged to my elder brother charles martel and since charles was on the throne of hungary which he inherited from his mother the kingdom of naples devolved by right upon his eldest son carobert and not on me who am the third in rank of the family and i have suffered myself to be crowned in my nephew's stead though he was the only lawful king i have put the younger branch in the place of the elder and for thirty-three years i have stifled the reproaches of my conscience true i have won battles made laws founded churches but a single word serves to give the lie to all the pompous titles showered upon me by the people's admiration and this one word rings out clearer in my ears than all the flattery of courtiers all the songs of poets all the orations of the crowd i am a usurper be not unjust towards yourself my lord and bear in mind that if you did not abdicate in favour of the rightful heir 
it was because you wished to save the people from the worst misfortunes moreover continued the queen with that air of profound conviction that an unanswerable argument inspires you have remained king by the consent and authority of our holy father the sovereign pontiff who disposes of the throne as a fief belonging to the church i have long quieted my scruples thus replied the dying man and the pope's authority has kept me silent but whatever security one may pretend to feel in one's lifetime there yet comes a dreadful solemn hour when all illusions needs must vanish this hour for me has come and now i must appear before god the one unfailing judge if his justice cannot fail is not his mercy infinite pursued the queen with the glow of sacred inspiration even if there were good reason for the fear that has shaken your soul what fault could not be effaced by a repentance so noble have you not repaired the wrong you may have done your nephew carobert by bringing his younger son andre to your kingdom and marrying him to joan your poor charles's elder daughter will not they inherit your crown alas cried robert with a deep sigh god is punishing me perhaps for thinking too late of this just reparation oh my good and noble sandra you touch a chord which vibrates sadly in my heart and you anticipate the unhappy confidence i was about to make i feel a gloomy presentiment and in the hour of my death presentiment is prophecy that the two sons of my nephew louis who has been king of hungary since his father died and andre whom i desired to make king of naples will prove the scourge of my family ever since andre set foot in our castle a strange fatality has pursued and overturned my projects i had hoped that if andre and joan were brought up together a tender intimacy would arise between these two children and that the beauty of our skies our civilization and the attractions of our court would end by softening whatever rudeness there might be in the young hungarian's character but in spite of my efforts all is tended to cause coldness and even aversion between the bridal pair joan scarcely fifteen is far ahead of her age gifted with a brilliant and mobile mind a noble and lofty character a lively and glowing fancy now free and frolicsome as a child now grave and proud as a queen trustful and simple as a young girl passionate and sensitive as a woman she presents the most striking contrast to andre who after a stay of ten years at our court is wilder more gloomy more intractable than ever his cold regular features impassive countenance and indifference to every pleasure that his wife appears to love all this has raised between him and joan a barrier of indifference even of antipathy to the tenderest effusion his reply is no more than a scornful smile or a frown and he never seems happier than when on a pretext of the chase he can escape from the court these then are the two man and wife on whose heads my crown shall rest who in a short space will find themselves exposed to every passion whose dull growl has now been heard below a deceptive calm but which only awaits the moment when i breathe my last to burst forth upon them oh my god my god the queen kept repeating in her grief her arms fell by her side like the arms of a statue weeping by a tomb listen donna sandra i know that your heart has never clung to earthly vanities and that you only wait till god has called me to himself to withdraw to the convent of santa maria del Tocroce, founded by yourself in the hope that you might there end your days far be it from me to dissuade you from your sacred vocation 
when i am myself descending into the tomb and am conscious of the nothingness of all human greatness only grant me one year of widowhood before you pass on to your bridal with the lord one year in which you will watch over joan and her husband to keep from them all the dangers that threaten already the woman who was the seneschal's wife and her son have too much influence over our granddaughter be specially careful and amid the many interests intrigues and temptations that will surround the young queen distrust particularly the affection of bertrand d'artois the beauty of louis of tarentum and the ambition of charles of durazzo the king paused exhausted by the effort of speaking then turning on his wife a supplicating glance and extending his thin wasted hand he added in a scarcely audible voice once again i entreat you leave not the court before a year has passed do you promise me i promise my lord and now said robert whose face at these words took on a new animation call my confessor and the physician and summon the family oh, the hour is at hand and soon i shall not have the strength to speak my last words a few moments later the priest and the doctor re-entered the room their faces bathed in tears the king thanked them warmly for their care of him in his last illness and begged them help to dress him in the coarse garb of a franciscan monk that god as he said seeing him die in poverty humility and penitence might the more easily grant him pardon the confessor and doctor placed upon his naked feet the sandals worn by mendicant friars robed him in a franciscan frock and tied the rope about his waist stretched thus upon his bed his brow surmounted by his scanty locks with his long white beard and his hands crossed upon his breast the king of naples looked like one of those aged anchorites who spend their lives in mortifying the flesh and whose souls absorbed in heavenly contemplation glide insensibly from out their last ecstasy into eternal bliss some time he lay thus with closed eyes putting up a silent prayer to god then he bade them light the spacious room as for a great solemnity and gave a sign to the two persons who stood one at the head the other at the foot of the bed the two folding doors opened and the whole of the royal family with the queen at their head and the chief barons following took their places in silence around the dying king to hear his last wishes his eyes turned toward joan who stood next to him on his right hand with an indescribable look of tenderness and grief she was of a beauty so unusual and so marvellous that her grandfather was fascinated by the dazzling sight and mistook her for an angel that god had sent to console him on his deathbed the pure lines of her fine profile her great black liquid eyes her noble brow uncovered her hair shining like the raven's wing her delicate mouth the whole effect of this beautiful face on the mind of those who beheld her was that of a deep melancholy and sweetness impressing itself once and for ever tall and slender but without the excessive thinness of some young girls her movements had that careless supple grace that recall the waving of a flower stalk in the breeze but in spite of all these smiling and innocent graces one could yet discern in robert's heiress a will firm and resolute to brave every obstacle and the dark rings that circled her fine eyes plainly showed that her heart was already agitated by passions beyond her years Beside Joan stood her younger sister, Marie, who was twelve or thirteen years of age, the second daughter of Charles, Duke of Calabria, who had died before her birth and whose mother, Marie of Valois, had unhappily been lost to her from the cradle. Exceedingly pretty and shy, she seemed distressed by such an assembly of great personages, and quietly drew near to the widow of the Grand Seneschal, Philippa, surnamed the Catanese, the princess's governess, whom they honored as a mother behind the princesses and beside this lady stood her son robert of caban a handsome young man proud and upright who with his left hand played with his slight moustache while he secretly cast on joan a glance of audacious boldness the group was completed by donna sansa the young chamberwoman to the princesses and by the count of terlizzi who exchanged with her many a furtive look and many an open smile 
The second group was composed of Andre, Joan's husband, and Friar Robert, tutor to the young prince, who had come with him from Budapest and never left him for a moment. Andre was at this time perhaps eighteen years old. At first sight, one was struck by the extreme regularity of his features, his handsome, noble face, and abundant fair hair. But among all these Italian faces with their vivid animation, his countenance lacked expression. His eyes seemed dull, and something hard and icy in his looks revealed his wild character and foreign extraction. His tutor's portrait, Petrarch, has drawn for us. Crimson face, hair and beard red, figure short and crooked, proud in poverty, rich and miserly, like a second Diogenes with hideous and deformed limbs, barely concealed beneath his friar's frock. In the third group stood the widow of Philip, Prince of Tarentum, the king's brother, honored at the court of Naples with the title of Empress of Constantinople, a style inherited by her as the granddaughter of Baldwin II. Anyone accustomed to sound the depths of the human heart would at one glance have perceived that this woman, under her ghastly pallor, concealed an implacable hatred, a venomous jealousy, and an all-devouring ambition. She had her three sons about her, Robert, Philip, and Louis the youngest. Had the king chosen out from among his nephews the handsomest, bravest, and most generous, there can be no doubt that Louis of Tarentum would have obtained the crown. At the age of twenty-three he had already excelled the cavaliers of most renown in feats of arms. Honest, loyal, and brave, he no sooner conceived a project than he promptly carried it out. His brow shone in that clear light which seems to serve as a halo of success to natures so privileged as his. His fine eyes, of a soft and velvety black, subdued the hearts of men who could not resist their charm, and his caressing smile made conquest sweet. A child of destiny, he had but to use his will. Some power unknown, some beneficent fairy had watched over his birth, and undertaken to smooth away all obstacles, and gratify all desires. Near to him, but in the fourth group, his cousin Charles of Duras stood and scowled, his mother Agnes, the widow of the Duke of Durazzo and Albania, another of the king's brothers, looked upon him affrighted, clutching to her breast her two younger sons, Ludovico, Count of Gravina, and Robert, Prince of Moria. Charles, pale-faced, with short hair and thick beard, was glancing with suspicion first at his dying uncle, and then at Joan, and the little Marie, then again at his cousins, apparently so excited by tumultuous thoughts that he could not stand still. His feverish uneasiness presented a marked contrast with the calm, dreamy face of Bertrand d'Artois, who, giving precedence to his father Charles, approached the queen at the foot of the bed, and so found himself face to face with Joan. The young man was so absorbed by the beauty of the princess that he seemed to see nothing else in the room. As soon as Joan and André, the princes of Tarentum and Durazzo, the counts of Artois and Queen Sancha had taken their places round the bed of death, forming a semicircle as we have just described, the vice-chancellor passed through the rows of barons, who according to their rank were following closely after the princes of the blood, and bowing low before the king, unfolded a parchment sealed with the royal seal, and read in a solemn voice, amid a profound silence. Robert, by the grace of God, King of Sicily and Jerusalem, Count of Provence, Folacquer and Piedmont, Vicar of the Holy Roman Church, hereby nominates and declares his sole heiress in the kingdom of Sicily on this side and the other side of the strait, as also in the counties of Provence, Folacquer and Piedmont, and in all his other territories, Joan, Duchess of Calabria, elder daughter of the excellent Lord Charles, Duke of Calabria, of illustrious memory. Moreover, he nominates and declares the Honorable Lady Marie, young daughter of the late Duke of Calabria, his heiress in the county of Alba, and in the jurisdiction of the valley of Grati, and the territory of Giordano, with all their castles and dependencies, and orders that the lady thus named receive them in fief direct from the aforesaid Duchess and her heirs. On this condition, however, that if the Duchess give and grant to her illustrious sister, or to her assigns the sum of ten thousand ounces of gold, by way of compensation, the county and jurisdiction aforesaid shall remain in the possession of the Duchess and her heirs. Moreover, he wills and commands, for private and secret reasons, that the aforesaid Lady Marie shall contract a marriage with the very illustrious Prince Louis, 
reigning king of Hungary, and in case any impediment should appear to this marriage by reason of the union said to be already arranged and signed between the king of Hungary and the king of Bohemia and his daughter, our lord the king commands that the illustrious lady Marie shall contract a marriage with the elder son of the mighty lord Don Juan, duke of Normandy, himself the elder son of the reigning king of France. At this point Charles of Durazzo gave Marie a singularly meaning look, which escaped the notice of all present their attention being absorbed by the reading of Robert's will. The young girl herself, for the moment when she first heard her own name, had stood confused and thunderstruck, with scarlet cheeks not daring to raise her eyes. The vice-chancellor continued, Moreover, he has willed and commanded that the counties of Fourcalquier and Provence shall in all perpetuity be united to his kingdom, and shall form one sole and inseparable dominion, whether or not there be several sons or daughters or any other reason of any kind for its partition, seeing that this union is of the utmost importance for the security and common prosperity of the kingdom and counties aforesaid. Moreover, he has decided and commanded that in case of the death of the Duchess Joan, which God avert, without lawful issue of her body, the most illustrious Lord André, Duke of Calabria, her husband, shall have the Principality of Salerno, with the title, fruits, revenues, and all the rights thereof, together with the revenue of two thousand ounces of gold for maintenance. Moreover, he has decided and ordered that the Queen above all, and also the venerable Father Don Philippe of Casabole, Bishop of Cavaillon, Vice-Chancellor of the Kingdom of Sicily, and the magnificent Lords Philip of Sanguinetto, Seneschal of Provence, Godfrey of Marsan, Count of Squillace, Admiral of the Kingdom, and Charles of Artois, Count of Air, shall be governors, regents, and administrators of the aforesaid Lord André, and the aforesaid ladies Joan and Marie, until such time as the Duke, the Duchess, and the very illustrious Lady Marie shall have attained their twenty-fifth year, etc., etc., when the vice-chancellor had finished reading, the king sat up, and glancing round upon his fair and numerous family, thus spoke. "'My children, you have heard my last wishes. I have bidden you all to my deathbed, that you may see how the glory of the world passes away. Those whom men name the great ones of the earth have more duties to perform, and after death more accounts to render.' It is in this that their greatness lies. I have reigned thirty-three years, and God before whom I am about to appear, God to whom my sighs have often arisen during my long and painful life, God alone knows the thoughts that rend my heart in the hour of death. Soon shall I be lying in the tomb, and all that remains of me in this world will live in the memory of those who pray for me. But before I leave you forever, you, oh, you who are twice my daughters, whom I have loved with a double love, and you, my nephews, who have had for me all the care and affection of a father, promise me to be ever united in heart and in wish, as indeed you are in my love. I have lived longer than your father's, I the eldest of all, and thus no doubt God has wished to tighten the bonds of your affection, to accustom you to live in one family, and to pay honor to one head. I have loved you all alike, as a father should, without exception or preference. I have disposed of my throne according to the law of nature and the inspiration of my conscience. Here are the heirs of the crown of Naples. You— Joan, and you, André, will never forget the love and respect that are due between husband and wife, and mutually sworn by you at the foot of the altar, and you, my nephews, all, my barons, my officers, render homage to your lawful sovereigns, André of Hungary, Louis of Tarantum, Charles of Durazzo. Remember that you are brothers." Woe to him who shall imitate the perfidy of Cain! May his blood fall upon his own head, and may he be accursed by heaven as he is by the mouth of a dying man! And may the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon that man whose heart is good, and when the Lord of mercy shall call to my soul himself! The king remained motionless, his arms raised, 
his eyes fixed on heaven, his cheeks extraordinarily bright, while the princes, barons, and officers of the court proffered to Joan and her husband the oath of fidelity and allegiance. When it was the turn of the princes of Dura to advance, Charles disdainfully stalked past André, and bending his knee before the princess said in a loud voice as he kissed her hand, "'To you, my queen, I pay my homage.' All looks were turned fearfully towards the dying man, but the good king no longer heard. Seeing him fall back rigid and motionless, Dona Sancha burst into sobs and cried in a voice choked with tears, "'The king is dead. Let us pray for his soul.' At the very same moment all the princes hurried from the room, and every passion hitherto suppressed by the presence of the king now found its vent like a mighty torrent breaking through its banks. "'Long live Joan!' Robert of Cabane, Louis of Tarentum, and Bertrand of Artois were the first to exclaim, while the prince's tutor, furiously breaking through the crowd and apostrophizing the various members of the Council of Regency, cried aloud in varying tones of passion, "'Gentlemen, you have forgotten the king's wish already! You must cry! Long live André, too!' Then, wedding example to precept, and himself making more noise than all the barons together, he cried in a voice of thunder, long live the king of naples but there was no echo to this cry and charles of durazzo measuring the dominican with a terrible look approached the queen and taking her by the hand slid back the curtains of the balcony from which was seen the square and the town of naples so far as the eye could reach there stretched an immense crowd illuminated by streams of light and thousands of heads were turned upward towards castel nuovo to gather any news that might be announced Charles, respectfully drawing back and indicating his fair cousin with his hand, cried out, "'People of Naples! The king is dead! Long live the queen!' "'Long live Joan, queen of Naples!' replied the people with a single mighty cry that resounded through every quarter of the town. The events that on this night had followed each other with the rapidity of a dream had produced so deep an impression on Joan's mind that agitated by a thousand different feelings, she retired to her own rooms, and shutting herself up in her chamber, gave free vent to her grief. So long as the conflict of so many ambitions waged about the tomb, the young queen, refusing every consolation that was offered her, wept bitterly for the death of her grandfather, who had loved her to the point of weakness. The king was buried with all solemnity in the church of Santa Chiara, which he had himself founded and dedicated to the Holy Sacrament, enriching it with magnificent frescoes by Giotto and other precious relics, among which is shown still, behind the tribune of the high altar, two columns of white marble taken from Solomon's temple. There still lies Robert, represented on his tomb in the dress of a king, and in a monk's frock, on the right of the monument to his son Charles, the Duke of Calabria. End of chapter 1 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 2 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 6, Part 1. Joan of Naples by Alexander Dumas. Translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2. As soon as the obsequies were over, André's tutor hastily assembled the chief Hungarian lords, and it was decided in a council held in the presence of the prince and with his consent to send letters to his mother, Elizabeth of Poland, and his brother, Louis of Hungary, to make known to them the purport of Robert's will, and at the same time to lodge a complaint at the court of Avignon against the conduct of the princes and people of Naples, in that they have proclaimed Joan alone Queen of Naples, thus overlooking the rights of her husband, and further to demand for him the Pope's order for André's coronation. Friar Robert, who had not only a profound knowledge of the court intrigues, but also the experience of a philosopher and all a monk's cunning, told his pupil that he ought to profit by the depression of spirit the king's death had produced in Joan, and ought not to suffer her favorites to use this time in influencing her by their seductive counsels. But Joan's ability to receive consolation was quite as ready as her grief had at first been impetuous. The sobs which seemed to be breaking her heart ceased all at once, New thoughts, more gentle, less lugubrious, took possession of the young queen's mind. The trace of tears vanished, and a smile lit up her liquid eyes like the sun's ray following on rain. This change, anxiously awaited, 
was soon observed by Joan's chamberwoman. She stole to the queen's room, and falling on her knees in accents of flattery and affection, she offered her first congratulations to her lovely mistress. Joan opened her arms and held her in a long embrace, for Donna Concha was far more to her than a lady-in-waiting. She was the companion of infancy, the depositary of all her secrets, the confidant of her most private thoughts. One had but to glance at this young girl to understand the fascination she could scarcely fail to exercise over the queen's mind. She had a frank and smiling countenance, such as inspires confidence and captivates the mind at first sight. Her face had an irresistible charm, with clear blue eyes, warm golden hair, mouth bewitchingly turned up at the corners, and delicate little chin. Wild, happy, light of heart, pleasure and love were the breath of her being. Her dainty refinement, her charming inconstancies, all made her at sixteen as lovely as an angel, though at heart she was corrupt. The whole court was at her feet, and Joan felt more affection for her than for her own sister. "'Well, my dear Concha,' she murmured with a sigh, you find me very sad and very unhappy. "'And you find me, fair queen,' replied the confidant, fixing an admiring look on Joan. "'You find me just the opposite. Very happy that I can lay at your feet before anyone else the proof of the joy that the people of Naples are at this moment feeling. Others perhaps may envy you the crown that shines upon your brow, the throne which is one of the noblest in the world, the shouts of this entire town that sound rather like worship than homage.' But I, madame, I envy you your lovely black hair, your dazzling eyes, your more than mortal grace, which makes every man adore you. And yet you know, my concha, I am much to be pitied both as a queen and as a woman. When one is fifteen, a crown is heavy to wear, and I have not the liberty of the meanest of my subjects. I mean in my affections, for before I reached an age when I could think, I was sacrificed to a man whom I can never love. "'Yet, madame,' replied Concha in a more insinuating voice, "'in this court there is a young cavalier who might, by virtue of respect, love, and devotion, have made you forget the claims of this foreigner, alike unworthy to be our king and to be your husband.' The queen heaved a heavy sigh. "'When did you lose your skill to read my heart?' she cried. "'Must I actually tell you that this love is making me wretched? True.' At the very first, this unsanctioned love was a keen joy. A new life seemed to wake within my heart. I was drawn on, fascinated by the prayers, the tears, and the despair of this man, by the opportunities that his mother so easily granted, she whom I had always looked upon as my own mother. I have loved him. Oh, my God! I am still so young, and my past is so unhappy. At times, strange thoughts come into my mind. I fancy he no longer loves me, that he never did love me. I fancy that he has been led on by ambition, by self-interest, by some ignoble motive, and has only feigned a feeling that he has never really felt. I feel myself a coldness I cannot account for. In his presence I am constrained. I am troubled by his look. His voice makes me tremble. I fear him. I would sacrifice a year of my life could I never have listened to him." These words seemed to touch the young confidant to the very depths of her soul. A shade of sadness crossed her brow. Her eyelids dropped, and for some time she answered nothing, showing sorrow rather than surprise. Then, lifting her head gently, she said with visible embarrassment, "'I should never have dared to pass so severe a judgment upon a man whom my sovereign lady has raised above other men by casting upon him a look of kindness. But if Robert of Cabane has deserved the reproach of inconstancy and ingratitude, if he has perjured himself like a coward, he must indeed be the basest of all miserable beings, despising a happiness which other men might have entreated of God the whole time of their life, and paid for through eternity. One man I know who weeps both night and day, without hope or consolation, consumed by a slow and painful malady, when one word might yet avail to save him, did it come from the lips of my noble mistress. "'I would not hear another word,' cried Joan, suddenly rising. There shall be no new cause for remorse in my life. Trouble has come upon me through my loves, both lawful and criminal. Alas, no longer will I try to control my awful fate. I will bow my head without a murmur. I am the queen, and I must yield myself up for the good of my subjects. Will you forbid me, madame? replied Donna Concha, in a kind, affectionate tone. 
will you forbid me to name bertrand of artois in your presence that unhappy man with the beauty of an angel and the modesty of a girl now that you are queen and have the life and death of your subjects in your own keeping will you feel no kindness towards an unfortunate one whose only fault is to adore you who strives with all his mind and strength to bear a chance look of yours without dying of his joy i have struggled hard never to look on him cried the queen urged by an impulse she was not strong enough to conquer then to efface the impression that might well have been made on her friend's mind she added severely i forbid you to pronounce his name before me and if he should ever venture to complain i bid you tell him from me that the first time i even suspect the cause of his distress he will be banished for ever from my presence ah madame dismiss me also for i shall never be strong enough to do so hard a bidding the unhappy man who cannot awake in your heart so much as a feeling of pity may now be struck down by yourself in your wrath for here he stands he has heard your sentence and come to die at your feet the last words were spoken in a louder voice so that they might be heard from outside and bertrand de artois came hurriedly into the room and fell on his knees before the queen for a long time past the young lady-in-waiting had perceived that robert of cabane had through his own fault lost the love of joan for his tyranny had indeed become more unendurable to her than her husband's donna cancha had been quick enough to perceive that the eyes of her young mistress were wont to rest with a kind of melancholy gentleness on bertrand and a young man of handsome appearance but with a sad and dreamy expression so when she made up her mind to speak in his interests she was persuaded that the queen already loved him still a bright color overspread joan's face and her anger would have fallen on both culprits alike when in the next room a sound of steps was heard and the voice of the grand seneschal's widow in conversation with her son fell on the ears of the three young people like a clap of thunder dona cancha pale as death stood trembling bertrand felt that he was lost all the more because his presence compromised the queen joan only with that wonderful presence of mind she was destined to preserve in the most difficult crises of her future life thrust the young man against the carved back of her bed and concealed him completely beneath the ample curtain she then signed to cancha to go forward and meet the governess and her son but before we conduct into the queen's room these two persons whom our readers may remember in joan's train about the bed of king robert we must relate the circumstances which had caused the family of the Catanese to rise with incredible rapidity from the lowest class of the people to the highest rank at court when donna violante of aragon first wife of robert of anjou became the mother of charles who was later on the duke of calabria a nurse was sought for the infant among the most handsome women of the people after inspecting many women of equal merit as regards beauty youth and health the prince's choice alighted on philippa a young catanese woman the wife of a fisherman of trapani and by condition a laundress this young woman as she washed her linen on the bank of a stream had dreamed strange dreams she had fancied herself summoned to court wedded to a great personage and receiving the honours of a great lady thus when she was called to castel nuovo her joy was great for she felt that her dreams now began to be realised philippa was installed at the court and a few months after she began to nurse the child the fisherman was dead and she was a widow meanwhile raymond of cabane the major-domo of king charles the second's house had bought a negro from some corsairs and having had him baptized by his own name had given him his liberty afterwards observing that he was able and intelligent he had appointed him head cook in the king's kitchen and then he had gone away to the war during the absence of his patron the negro managed his own affairs at the court so cleverly that in a short time he was able to buy land houses farms silver plate and horses and could vie in riches with the best in the kingdom and as he constantly won higher favor in the royal family he passed on from the kitchen to the wardrobe the catanese had also deserved very well of her employers and as a reward for the care she had bestowed on the child the princess married her to the negro and he as a wedding gift was granted the title of knight from this day forward raymond of cabane and philippa the laundress rose in the world so rapidly that they had no equal in influence at court after the death of donna violante the catanese became the intimate friend of donna sandra robert's second wife whom we introduced to our readers at the beginning of this narrative charles her foster son loved her as a mother and she was the confidante of his two wives in turn especially of the second wife maria valois and as the quondam laundress 
and had in the end learned all the manners and customs of the court, she was chosen at the birth of Joan and her sister to be governess and mistress over the young girls, and at this juncture Raymond was created major domo. Finally, Maria Valois on her deathbed commended the two young princesses to her care, begging her to look on them as her own daughters. Thus, Philippa the Catanese, honored in future as foster mother of the heiress to the throne of Naples, had power to nominate her husband Grand Seneschal, one of the seven most important offices in the kingdom, and to obtain knighthood for her sons. Raymond of Cabane was buried like a king in a marble tomb in the Church of the Holy Sacrament, and there was speedily joined by two of his sons. The third, Robert, a youth of extraordinary strength and beauty, gave up an ecclesiastical career and was himself made major-domo, his two sisters being married to the Count of Melizzi and the Count of Marconi, respectively. This was now the state of affairs, and the influence of the Grand Seneschal's widow seemed forever established when an unexpected event suddenly occurred, causing such injury as might well suffice to upset the edifice of her fortunes that had been raised stone by stone patiently and slowly. This edifice was now undermined and threatened to fall in a single day. It was the sudden apparition of Friar Robert, who followed to the court of Rome his young pupil, who from infancy had been Joan's destined husband, which thus shattered all the designs of the Catanese and seriously menaced her future. The monk had not been slow to understand that so long as she remained at the court, André would be no more than the slave, possibly even the victim of his wife. Thus all Friar Robert's thoughts were obstinately concentrated on a single end, that of getting rid of the Catanese or neutralizing her influence. The prince's tutor and the governess of the heiress had but to exchange one glance, icy, penetrating, plain to read. Their looks met like lightning flashes of hatred and of vengeance. The Catanese, who felt she was detected, lacked courage to fight this man in the open, and so conceived the hope of strengthening her tottering empire by the arts of corruption and debauchery. She instilled by degrees into her pupil's mind the poison of vice, inflamed her youthful imagination with precocious desires, sowed in her heart the seeds of an inconquerable aversion for her husband, surrounded the poor child with abandoned women, and especially attached to her the beautiful and attractive Donna Cancha, who was branded by contemporary authors with the name of a courtesan, then summed up all these lessons in infamy by prostituting Joan to her own son. The poor girl, polluted by sin before she knew what life was, threw her whole self into this first passion with all the ardor of youth, and loved Robert of Cabane so violently, so madly, that the Catanese congratulated herself on the success of her infamy, believing that she held her prey so fast in her toils that her victim would never attempt to escape them. A year passed by before Joan, conquered by her infatuation, conceived the smallest suspicion of her lover's sincerity. He, more ambitious than affectionate, found it easy to conceal his coldness under the cloak of a brotherly intimacy, of blind submission, and of unswerving devotion. Perhaps he would have deceived his mistress for a longer time had not Bertrand of Artois fallen madly in love with Joan. Suddenly the bandage fell from the young girl's eyes, comparing the two with natural instinct of a woman beloved, which never goes astray. She perceived that Robert of Cabane loved her for his own sake, while Bertrand of Artois would give his life to make her happy. A light fell upon her past. She mentally recalled the circumstances that preceded and accompanied her earliest love, and a shudder went through her at the thought that she had been sacrificed to a cowardly seducer by the very woman she had loved most in the world, whom she had called by the name of mother. Joan drew back into herself and wept bitterly. Wounded by a single blow in all her affections, at first her grief absorbed her. Then, roused to sudden anger, she proudly raised her head, for now her love was changed to scorn. Robert, amazed at her cold and haughty reception of him, following on so great a love, was stung by jealousy and wounded pride. He broke out into bitter reproach and violent recrimination, and letting fall the mask, once for all lost his place in Joan's heart. His mother at last saw that it was time to interfere. She rebuked her son, accusing him of upsetting all her plans by his clumsiness. "'As you have failed to conquer her by love,' she said, "'you must now subdue her by fear. The secret of her honour is in our hands. She will never dare to rebel. She plainly loves Bertrand of Artois, whose languishing eyes and humble sighs contrast in a striking manner with your haughty indifference and your masterful ways.' the mother of the princes of Tarentum, 
the empress of constantinople will easily seize an occasion of helping on the prince's love so as to alienate her more and more from her husband Concha will be the go-between, and sooner or later we shall find Bertrand at Joan's feet. Then she will be able to refuse us nothing. While all this was going on, the old king died, and the Catanese, who had unceasingly kept on the watch for the moment she had so plainly foreseen, loudly called to her son when she saw Bertrand slip into Joan's apartment, saying, as she drew him after her, "'Follow me. The queen is ours.' It was thus that she and her son came to be there, Joan standing in the middle of the chamber, pallid, her eyes fixed on the curtains of the bed, concealed her agitation with a smile, and took one step forward towards her governess, stooping to receive the kiss which the latter bestowed upon her every morning. The Catanese embraced her with affected cordiality, and turning to her son, who had knelt upon one knee, said, pointing to Robert, "'My fair queen!' allow the humblest of your subjects to offer his sincere congratulations and to lay his homage at your feet rise robert said joan extending her hand kindly and with no show of bitterness we were brought up together i shall never forget that in our childhood i mean those happy days when we were both innocent i called you my brother as you allow me madame said robert with an ironical smile I, too, shall always remember the names you formerly gave me. "'And I,' said the Catanese, "'shall forget that I speak to the Queen of Naples "'in embracing once more my beloved daughter. "'Come, madame, away with care. "'You have wept long enough. "'We have long respected your grief. "'It is now time to show yourself to these good Neapolitans "'who bless heaven continually for granting them a queen so beautiful and good.' It is time that your favors fall upon the heads of your faithful subjects, and my son, who surpasses all in his fidelity, comes first to ask a favor of you, in order that he may serve you yet more zealously. Joan cast on Robert a withering look, and speaking to the Catanese, said with a scornful air, You know, madame, I can refuse your son nothing. All he asks, continued the lady, is a title which is his due and which he inherited from his father the title of grand seneschal of the two sicilies i trust my daughter you will have no difficulty in granting this but i must consult the council of regency the council will hasten to ratify the queen's wishes replied robert handing her the parchment with an imperious gesture you need only speak to the count of artois and he cast a threatening glance at the curtain which had slightly moved you are right said the queen at once and going up to a table she signed the parchment with a trembling hand now my daughter i have come in the name of all the care i bestowed on your infancy of all the maternal love i have lavished on you to implore a favor that my family will remember for evermore the queen recoiled one step crimson with astonishment and rage but before she could find words to reply, the lady continued in a voice that betrayed no feeling. "'I request you to make my son Count of Eboli.' "'That has nothing to do with me, madame. The barons of this kingdom would revolt to a man, if I were on my own authority, to exalt to one of the first dignitaries the son of a—' "'A laundress and a negro, you would say, madame,' said Robert, with his sneer. Bertrand of Artois would be annoyed, perhaps, if I had a title like his. He advanced a step towards the bed, his hand upon the hilt of his sword. "'Have mercy, Robert,' cried the queen, checking him. "'I will do all you ask.' And she signed the parchment, naming him Count of Eboli. "'And now,' Robert went on impudently, "'to show that my new title is not illusory, Ah, uh, while you are busy about signing documents, let me have the privilege of taking part in the councils of the crown. Make a declaration that, subject to your good pleasure, my mother and I are to have a deliberative voice in the council whenever an important matter is under discussion. Never! cried Joan, turning pale. Philippa and Robert, you abuse my weakness and treat your queen shamefully. In the last few days I have wept and suffered continually, overcome by a terrible grief— I have no strength to turn to business now. Leave me, I beg. I feel my strength gives way. 
"'What, my daughter?' cried the Catanese hypocritically. "'Are you feeling unwell? Come and lie down at once.' And hurrying to the bed, she took hold of the curtain that concealed the Count of Artois. The queen uttered a piercing cry and threw herself before Filippo with the fury of a lioness. "'Stop!' she cried in a choking voice. "'Take the privilege you ask, and now, if you value your own life, leave me.' The Catanese and her son departed instantly, not even waiting for a reply, for they had got all they wanted, while Joan, trembling, ran desperately up to Bertrand, who had angrily drawn his dagger and would have fallen upon the two favorites to take vengeance for the insults they had offered to the queen. But he was very soon disarmed by the lovely shining eyes raised to him in supplication, the two arms cast about him and the tears shed by Joan. He fell at her feet and kissed them rapturously, with no thought of seeking excuse for his presence, with no word of love, for it was as if they had always loved. He lavished the tenderest caresses on her, dried her tears, and pressed his trembling lips upon her lovely head. Joan began to forget her anger, her vows, and her repentance. Soothed by the music of her lover's speech, she returned uncomprehending monosyllables. Her heart beat till it felt like breaking, and once more she was falling beneath love's resistless spell, when a new interruption occurred, shaking her roughly out of her ecstasy. But this time the young count was able to pass quietly and calmly into a room adjoining, and Joan prepared to receive her importunate visitor with severe and frigid dignity. The individual who arrived at so inopportune a moment was a little calculated to smooth Joan's ruffled brow, being Charles, the eldest son of the Durazzo family. After he had introduced his fair cousin to the people as their only legitimate sovereign, he had sought on various occasions to obtain an interview with her, which in all probability would be decisive. Charles was one of those men who, to gain their end, recoil at nothing. Devoured by raging ambition and accustomed from his earliest years to conceal his most ardent desires beneath a mask of careless indifference, he marched ever onward, plot succeeding plot, toward the object he was bent upon securing, and never deviated one hair's breadth from the path he had marked out, but only acted with a double prudence after each victory, and with double courage after each defeat. His cheek grew pale with joy, when he hated most he smiled. In all the emotions of his life, however strong, he was inscrutable. He had sworn to sit on the throne of Naples, and long had believed himself the rightful heir, as being nearest of kin to Robert of all his nephews. To him the hand of Joan would have been given had not the old king in his latter days conceived the plan of bringing André from Hungary and re-establishing the elder branch in his person, though that had long since been forgotten. But his resolution had never for a moment been weakened by the arrival of André in the kingdom, or by the profound indifference wherewith Joan, preoccupied with other passion, had always received the advances of her cousin Charles of Durazzo. Neither the love of a woman nor the life of a man was of any account to him when a crown was weighed in the other scale of the balance. During the whole time that the queen had remained invisible, Charles had hung about her apartments, and now came into her presence with respectful eagerness, to inquire for his cousin's health. The young duke had been at pains to set off his noble features and elegant figure by a magnificent dress, covered with golden fleur-de-lis and glittering with precious stones. His doublet of scarlet velvet and cap of the same showed up by their own splendor, the warm coloring of his skin, while his face seemed illumined by his black eyes that shone keen as an eagle's. Charles spoke long with his cousin of the people's enthusiasm on her accession, and of the brilliant destiny before her. He drew a hasty but truthful sketch of the state of the kingdom, and while he lavished praises on the queen's wisdom, he cleverly pointed out what reforms were most urgently needed by the country. He contrived to put so much warmth, yet so much reserve, into his speech that he destroyed the disagreeable impression his arrival had produced. In spite of the irregularities of her youth and the depravity brought about by her wretched education, Joan's nature impelled her to noble action. When the welfare of her subjects was concerned, she rose above the limitations of her age and sex, and, forgetting her strange position, listened to the Duke of Durazzo with the liveliest interest and the kindliest attention. He then hazarded allusions to the dangers that beset a young queen, spoke vaguely of the difficulty in distinguishing between true devotion and cowardly complacence or interested attachment. He spoke of the ingratitude of many who had been loaded with benefits, and had been most completely trusted. Joan, who had just learned the truth of his words by sad experience, replied with a sigh, and after a moment's silence added, "'May God, whom I call to witness for the loyalty and uprightness of my intentions, 
make god unmask all traitors and show me my true friends i know that the burden laid upon me is heavy and i presume not on my strength but i trust that the tried experience of those counsellors to whom my uncle entrusted me the support of my family and your warm and sincere friendship above all my dear cousin will help me to accomplish my duty my sincerest prayer is that you may succeed my fair cousin and i will not darken with doubts and fears a time that ought to be given up to joy i will not mingle with the shouts of gladness that rise on all sides to proclaim you queen any vain regrets over that blind fortune which has placed beside the woman whom we all alike adore whose single glance would make a man more blessed than the angels a foreigner unworthy of your love and unworthy of your throne you forget charles said the queen putting out her hand as though to check his words andre is my husband and it was my grandfather's will that he should reign with me never cried the duke indignantly the king of naples nay the dream that the town is shaken to its very foundations that the people rise as one man that our church bells sound a new sicilian vespers before the people of naples will endure the rule of a handful of wild hungarian drunkards a deformed canting monk a prince detested by them even as you are beloved but why is andre blamed what has he done what has he done why why is he blamed madame the people blame him as stupid coarse a savage the nobles blame him for ignoring their privileges and openly supporting men of obscure birth and i madame here he lowered his voice blame him for making you unhappy joan shuddered as though a wound had been touched by an unkind hand but hiding her emotion beneath an appearance of calm she replied in a voice of perfect indifference you must be dreaming charles who has given you leave to suppose i am unhappy do not try to excuse him my dear cousin replied charles eagerly you will injure yourself without saving him the queen looked fixedly at her cousin as though she would read him through and through and find out the meaning of his words but as she could not give credence to the horrible thought that crossed her mind she assumed a complete confidence in her cousin's friendship with a view to discovering his plans and said carelessly well charles suppose i am not happy what remedy could you offer me that i might escape my lot you ask me that my dear cousin are not all remedies good when you suffer and when you wish for revenge one must fly to those means that are possible andre will not readily give up his pretensions he has a party of his own and in case of open rupture his brother the king of hungary may declare war upon us and bring ruin and desolation upon our kingdom the duke of duras faintly smiled and his countenance assumed a sinister expression you do not understand me he said then explain without circumlocution said the queen trying to conceal the convulsive shudder that ran through her limbs listen joan said charles taking his cousin's hand and laying it upon his heart can you feel that dagger i can said joan and she turned pale one word from you and yes tomorrow you will be free a murder cried joan recoiling in horror then i was not deceived it is a murder that you have proposed it is a necessity said the duke calmly today i advise later on you will give your orders enough wretch i cannot tell if you are more cowardly or more rash cowardly because you reveal a criminal plot feeling sure that i shall never denounce you rash because in revealing it to me you cannot tell what witnesses are near to hear it all in any case madame since i have put myself in your hands you must perceive that i cannot leave you till i know if i must look upon myself as your friend or as your enemy leave me cried joan with a disdainful gesture you insult your queen you forget my dear cousin that some day i may very likely have a claim to your kingdom do not force me to have you turned out of this room said joan advancing toward the door now do not get excited my fair cousin i am going but at least remember that i offered you my hand and you refused it remember what i say at this solemn moment today i am the guilty man some day perhaps i may be the judge he went away slowly 
twice turning his head, repeating in the language of his signs his menacing prophecy. Joan hid her face in her hands, and for a long time remained plunged in dismal reflections. Then anger got the better of all her other feelings, and she summoned Donna Cancha, bidding her not to allow anybody to enter on any pretext whatsoever. This prohibition was not for the Count of Artois, for the reader will remember that he was in the adjoining room. End of chapter 2 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 3 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 6, Part 1, Joan of Naples by Alexander Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 Night fell, and from the Molo to the Mergellina, from the Capuana Castle to the hill of St. Elmo, deep silence had succeeded the myriad sounds that go up from the noisiest city in the world. Charles of Durazzo, quickly walking away from the square of the Correggi, first casting one last look of vengeance at the Castel Nuovo, plunged into the labyrinth of dark streets that twist and turn, cross and recross each other. In this ancient city, and after a quarter of an hour's walking, that was first slow, then very rapid, arrived at his ducal palace near the church of San Giovanni al Mare. He gave certain instructions in a harsh, peremptory tone to a page who took his sword and cloak. Then Charles shut himself into his room, without going up to see his poor mother, who was weeping, sad and solitary, over her son's ingratitude, and like every other mother, taking her revenge by praying God to bless him. The Duke of Durazzo walked up and down his room several times like a lion in a cage, counting the minutes in a fever of impatience, and was on the point of summoning a servant and renewing his commands when two dull raps on the door informed him that the person he was waiting for had arrived. He opened at once, and a man of about fifty, dressed in black from head to foot, entered, humbly bowing, and carefully shut the door behind him. Charles threw himself into an easy chair, and gazing fixedly at the man who stood before him, his eyes on the ground and his arms crossed upon his breast in an attitude of the deepest respect and blind obedience, he said slowly, as though weighing each word, "'Master Nicholas of Malazzo, have you any remembrance left of the services I once rendered you?' The man to whom these words were addressed trembled in every limb, as if he heard the voice of Satan come to claim his soul. Then, lifting a look of terror to his questioner's face, he asked in a voice of gloom, "'What have I done, my lord, to deserve this reproach?' "'It is not a reproach. I ask a simple question.' "'Can my lord doubt for a moment of my eternal gratitude? Can I forget the favours your excellency showed me?' Even if I could so lose my reason and my memory, are not my wife and son ever here to remind me that to you we owe all our life, our honor, and our fortune? I was guilty of an infamous act, said the notary, lowering his voice, a crime that would not only have brought upon my head the penalty of death, but which meant the confiscation of my goods, the ruin of my family, poverty, and shame for my only son— that very son, sire, for whom I, miserable wretch, had wished to ensure a brilliant future by means of my frightful crime. You had in your hands the proof of this. I have them still. And you will not ruin me, my lord, resumed the notary, trembling. I am at your feet. Your excellency, take my life. I will die in torment without a murmur. But save my son, since you have been so merciful as to spare him till now. Have pity on his mother. My lord, have pity. Be assured, said Charles, signing to him to rise. It is nothing to do with your life. That will come later, perhaps. What I wish to ask of you now is a much simpler, easier matter. My lord, I await your command. First, said the duke in a voice of playful irony, you must draw up a formal contract of my marriage. At once, your excellency. You are to write in the first article that my wife brings me as dowry the county of Alba, the jurisdiction of Grati and Giordano, with all castles, fiefs, and last dependents thereto. But, my lord, replied the poor notary, greatly embarrassed, do you find any difficulty, Master Nicholas? "'God forbid, Your Excellency, but—' "'Well, what is it?' 
because if my lord will permit because there is only one person in naples who possesses that dowry your excellency mentions and so and she stammered the notary embarrassed more and more she is the queen's sister and in the contract you will write the name of marie of anjou but the young maiden replied nicholas timidly whom your excellency should marry is destined i thought under the will of our late king of blessed memory to become the wife of the king of hungary or else of the grandson of the king of france ah i understand your surprise you may learn from this that an uncle's intentions are not always the same as his nephew's in that case sire if i dared if my lord would deign to give me leave if i had an opinion i might give i would humbly entreat your excellency to reflect that this would mean the abduction of a minor since when did you learn to be scrupulous master nicholas these words were uttered with a glance so terrible that the poor notary was crushed and had hardly the strength to reply in an hour the contract will be ready good we agree as to the first point continued charles resuming his natural tone of voice you now will hear my second charge you have known the duke of calabria's valet for the last two years pretty intimately tommaso pace why he is my best friend excellent listen and remember that on your discretion the safety or ruin of your family depends a plot will soon be on foot against the queen's husband the conspirators no doubt will gain over andre's valet the man you call your best friend never leave him for an instant try to be his shadow day by day and hour by hour come to me and report the progress of the plot the names of the plotters is this all your excellency's command all the notary respectfully bowed and withdrew to put the orders at once into execution charles spent the rest of that night writing to his uncle the cardinal de perigord one of the most influential prelates at the court of avignon he begged him before all things to use his authority so as to prevent pope clement from signing the bull that would sanction andre's coronation and he ended his letter by earnestly entreating his uncle to win the pope's consent to his marriage with the queen's sister we shall see fair cousin he said as he sealed his letter which of us is best at understanding where our interest lies you would not have me as a friend so you shall have me as an enemy sleep on in the arms of your lover i will wake you when the time comes i shall be duke of calabria perhaps some day and that title as you well know belongs to the heir to the throne the next day and on the following days a remarkable change took place in the behavior of charles towards andre he showed him signs of great friendliness cleverly flattering his inclinations and even persuading friar robert that far from feeling any hostility in the matter of andre's coronation his most earnest desire was that his uncle's wishes should be respected and that though he might have given the impression of acting contrary to them it had only been done with a view to appeasing the populace who in their first excitement might have been stirred up to insurrection against the hungarians he declared with much warmth that he heartily detested the people about the queen whose counsels tended to lead her astray and he promised to join friar robert in the endeavor to get rid of joan's favorites by all such means as fortune might put at his disposal although the dominican did not believe in the least the sincerity of his ally's protestations he yet gladly welcomed the aid which might prove so useful to the prince's cause and attributed the sudden change of front to some recent rupture between charles and his cousin promising himself that he would make capital out of his resentment be that as it might charles wormed himself into andre's heart and after a few days one of them could hardly be seen without the other if andre went out hunting his greatest pleasure in life charles was eager to put his pack or his falcons at his disposal if andre rode through the town charles was always ambling by his side he gave way to his whims urged him to extravagances and inflamed his angry passions in a word he was the good angel or the bad one who inspired his every thought and guided his every action joan soon understood this business and as a fact had expected it she could have ruined charles with a single word but she scorned so base a revenge and treated him with utter contempt thus the court was split into two factions the hungarians with friar robert at their head and supported by charles of durazzo 
and the other side all the nobility of Naples, led by the princes of Tarentum. Joan, influenced by the Grand Seneschal's widow and her two daughters, the Countesses of Tilizzi and Marconi, and also by Donna Concha and the Empress of Constantinople, took the side of the Neapolitan party against the pretensions of her husband. The partisans of the Queen made it their first care to have her name inscribed upon all public acts without adding Andres. But Joan, led by an instinct of right and justice amid all the corruption of her court, had only consented to this last after she had taken counsel with André de Zernia, a very learned lawyer of the day, respected as much for his lofty character as for his great learning. The prince, annoyed at being shut out in this way, began to act in a violent and despotic manner. On his own authority he released prisoners. He showered favors upon Hungarians and gave especial honors and rich gifts to Giovanni Pipino, Count of Altuaniera, the enemy of all others most dreaded and detested by the Neapolitan barons. Then the counts of San Severino, Mileto, Tilizzi, and Balzo, Calanzaro and Sant'Angelo, and most of the grandees, exasperated by the haughty insolence of André's favorite, which grew every day more outrageous, decided that he must perish, and his master with him, should he persist in attacking their privileges and defying their anger. Moreover, the women who were about Joan at the court egged her on, each one urged by a private interest in the pursuit of her fresh passion. Poor Joan, neglected by her husband and betrayed by Robert of Cabane, gave way beneath the burden of duties beyond her strength to bear, and fled for refuge to the arms of Bertrand Artois, whose love she did not even attempt to resist, for every feeling for religion and virtue had been destroyed in her own set purpose, and her young inclinations had been early bent towards vice, just as the bodies of wretched children are bent and their bones broken by jugglers when they train them. Bertrand felt himself uh, adoration for her surpassing ordinary human passion, when he reached the summit of a happiness to which, in his wildest dreams, he had never dared to aspire, the young count nearly lost his reason. In vain had his father, Charles of Artois, who was Count of Air, a direct descendant of Philip the Bold, and one of the regents of the kingdom, attempted by severe admonitions to stop him, while yet on the brink of the precipice. Bertrand would listen to nothing but his love for Joan and his implacable hatred for all the queen's enemies. Many a time at the close of day, as the breeze from Posilippo or Sorrento, coming from far away, was playing in his hair, might Bertrand be seen leaning from one of the casements of Castel Nuovo, pale and motionless, gazing fixedly from his side of the square to where the Duke of Calabria and the Duke of Durazzo came galloping home from their evening ride, side by side, in a cloud of dust. Then the brows of the young count were violently contracted. A savage, sinister look shone in his blue eyes once so innocent. Like lightning, a thought of death and vengeance flashed into his mind. He would all at once begin to tremble, as a light hand was laid upon his shoulder. He would turn softly, fearing lest the divine apparition should vanish to the skies. But there beside him stood a young girl, with cheeks aflame and heaving breast, with brilliant liquid eyes. She had come to tell how her past day had been spent, and to offer her forehead for the kiss that should reward her labors and unwilling absence. This woman, dictator of laws and administrator of justice among grave magistrates and stern ministers, was but fifteen years old. This man, who knew her griefs, and to avenge them, was meditating regicide, was not yet twenty. Two children of earth, the playthings of an awful destiny. Two months and a few days after the old king's death, on the morning of Friday the 28th of March of the same year, 1343, the widow of the Grand Seneschal, Philippa, who had already contrived to get forgiven for the shameful trick she had used to secure all her son's wishes, entered the queen's apartments, excited by a genuine fear. Pale and distracted, the bearer of news that spread terror and lamentation throughout the court. Marie, the queen's younger sister, had disappeared. The gardens and outside courts had been searched for any trace of her. Every corner of the castle had been examined. The guards had been threatened with torture so as to drag the truth from them. No one had seen anything of the princess, and nothing could be found that suggested either flight or abduction. Joan, struck down by this new blow in the midst of other troubles, was for a time utterly prostrated. Then, when she had recovered from her first surprise, she behaved as all people do if despair takes the place of reason. She gave orders for what was already done to be done again. She asked the same questions that could only bring the same answers, and poured forth vain regrets and unjust reproaches. The news spread through the town, causing the greatest astonishment. There arose a great commotion in the castle, 
and the members of the regency hastily assembled, while couriers were sent out in every direction, charged to promise twelve thousand ducats to whomsoever should discover the place where the princess was concealed. Proceedings were at once taken against the soldiers who were on guard at the fortress at the time of the disappearance. Bertrand de Bartois drew the queen apart, telling her his suspicions which fell directly upon Charles of Durazzo, but Joan lost no time in persuading him of the improbability of his hypothesis. First of all, Charles had never once set his foot in Castel Nuovo since the day of his stormy interview with the queen, but had made a point of always leaving André by the bridge when he came to the town with him. Besides, it had never been noticed even in the past that the young duke had spoken to Marie or exchanged looks with her. The result of all attainable evidence was that no stranger had entered the castle the evening before except a notary named Master Nicholas of Milazzo, an old person, half silly, half fanatical, for whom Tommaso Pace, valet de chambre to the Duke of Calabria, was ready to answer with his life. Bertrand yielded to the queen's reasoning, and day by day advanced new suggestions, each less probable than the last, to draw his mistress on to feel a hope that he was far from feeling himself. But a month later, and precisely on the morning of Monday the 30th of April, a strange and unexpected scene took place, an exhibition of boldness transcending all calculations. The Neapolitan people were stupefied in astonishment, and the grief of Joan and her friends was changed to indignation. Just as the clock of San Giovanni struck twelve, the gate of the magnificent palace of the Durazzo flung open its folding doors, and there came forth to the sound of trumpets a double file of cavaliers on richly caparisoned horses, with the duke's arms on their shields. They took up their station round the house to prevent the people outside from disturbing a ceremony which was to take place before the eyes of an immense crowd, assembled suddenly, as by a miracle, upon the square. At the back of the court stood an altar, and upon the steps lay two crimson valet cushions embroidered with the fleur-de-lis of France and the ducal crown. Charles came forward, clad in a dazzling dress, and holding by the hand the queen's sister, the Princess Marie, at that time almost thirteen years of age. She knelt down timidly on one of the cushions, and when Charles had done the same, the grand almoner of the Dura house asked the young duke solemnly what was his intention in appearing thus humbly before a minister of the church. At these words, Master Lickenlaus of Milazzo took his place on the left of the altar, and read in a firm, clear voice, first the contract of marriage between Charles and Marie, and then the apostolic letters from His Holiness, the Sovereign Pontiff, Clement the Sixth, who in his own name, removing all obstacles that might impede the union, such as the age of the young bride and the degrees of affinity between the two parties, authorized his dearly beloved son Charles, Duke of Durazzo and Albania, to take in marriage the most illustrious Marie of Anjou, sister of Joan, Queen of Naples and Jerusalem, and bestowed his benediction on the pair. The almoner then took the young girl's hand, and placing it in that of Charles's, pronounced the prayers of the church. Charles, turning half round to the people, said in a loud voice, "'Before God and man, this woman is my wife.' "'And this man is my husband,' said Marie, trembling. "'Long live the Duke and Duchess of Durazzo!' cried the crowd, clapping their hands, and the young pair, at once mounting two beautiful horses, and followed by their cavaliers and pages, solemnly paraded through the town, and re-entered their palace to the sound of trumpets and cheering. When this incredible news was brought to the queen, her first feeling was joy at the recovery of her sister, and when Bertrand of Artois was eager to head a band of barons and cavaliers, and bent on falling upon the cortege to punish the traitor, Joan put up her hand to stop him with a very mournful look. "'Alas,' she said sadly, "'it is too late. "'They are legally married for the head of the church, "'who is moreover by my grandfather's will the head of our family, "'has granted his permission. "'I only pity my poor sister. "'I pity her for becoming so young the prey of a wretched man "'who sacrifices her to his own ambition, "'hoping by this marriage to establish a claim to the throne. "'Oh, God, what a strange fate oppresses the royal house of Anjou!' my father's early death in the midst of his triumphs, my mother so quickly after, my sister and I the sole offspring of Charles I, both before we are women grown fallen into the hands of cowardly men who use us but as the stepping-stones of their ambition. Joan fell back exhausted on her chair, a burning tear trembling on her eyelid. "'This is the second time,' said Bertrand, reproachfully, 
that I have drawn my sword to avenge an insult offered to you. The second time I return it by your orders to the scabbard. But remember, Joan, the third time will not find me so docile, and then it will not be Robert of Camain or Charles of Durazzo that I shall strike, but him who is the cause of all your misfortunes. Have mercy, Bertrand. Do you not also speak these words? Whenever this horrible thought takes hold of me, let me come to you. This threat of bloodshed that is drummed into my ears, this sinister vision that haunts my sight, let me come to you, beloved, and weep upon your bosom, beneath your breath cool my burning fancies, from your eyes draw some little courage to revive my perishing soul. Come, I am quite unhappy enough without needing to poison the future by an endless remorse. Tell me rather to forgive and to forget. Speak not of hatred and revenge. Show me one ray of hope amid the darkness that surrounds me. Hold me up, my wavering feet, and push me not into the abyss. Such altercations as this were repeated as often as any fresh wrong arose from the side of André or his party. And in the proportion as the attacks made by Bertrand and his friends gained in vehemence, and we must add in justice, so did Joan's objections weaken. The Hungarian rule, as it became more and more arbitrary and unbearable, irritated men's minds to such a point that the people murmured in secret and the nobles proclaimed aloud their discontent. André's soldiers indulged in a libertinage which would have been intolerable in a conquered city. They were found everywhere, brawling in the taverns or rolling about disgustingly drunk in the gutters, and the prince, far from rebuking such orgies, was accused of sharing them himself. His former tutor, who ought to have felt bound to drag him away from so ignoble a mode of life, rather strove to immerse him in degrading pleasures so as to keep him out of business matters. Without suspecting it, he was hurrying on the denouement of the terrible drama that was being acted behind the scenes at Castel Nuovo. Robert's widow, Donna Sancha of Aragon, the good and sainted lady whom our readers may possibly have forgotten, as her family had done, seeing that God's anger was hanging over her house, and that no counsels, no tears or prayers of hers could avail to arrest it, after wearing mourning for her husband one whole year, according to her promise, had taken the veil at the convent of Santa Maria del Croce, and deserted the court and its follies and passions, just as the prophets of old, turning their back on some accursed city, would shake the dust from off their sandals and depart. Sandra's retreat was a sad omen and soon the family dissensions, long with difficulty suppressed, sprang forth to open view. The storm that had been threatening from afar broke suddenly over the town, and the thunderbolt was shortly to follow. On the last day of August, 1344, Joan rendered homage to Amaric, Cardinal of St. Martin and Legate of Clement VI, who looked upon the kingdom of Naples as being a fief of the church, ever since the time when his predecessors had presented it to Charles of Anjou, and overthrown and excommunicated the house of Suabia. For this solemn ceremony the church of Santa Clara was chosen, the burial place of Neapolitan kings, and but lately the tomb of the grandfather and father of the young queen, who reposed to right and left of the high altar. Joan, clad in the royal robe with the crown upon her head, uttered her oath of fidelity between the hands of the apostolic legate in the presence of her husband, who stood behind her simply as a witness, just like the other princes of the blood. Among the prelates with their pontifical insignia who formed the brilliant following of uh, the envoy, there stood the archbishops of Pisa, Bari, Capua, and Brindisi, and the reverend fathers, Ugolino, bishop of Castella, Philip, bishop of Cavallon, chancellor to the queen. All the nobility of Naples and Hungary were present at the ceremony which debarred André from the throne in a fashion at once formal and striking. Thus, when they left the church, the excited feelings of both parties made a crisis imminent, and such hostile glances, such threatening words were exchanged, that the prince, finding himself too weak to contend against his enemies, wrote the same evening to his mother, telling her that he was about to leave a country where, from his infancy upwards, he had experienced nothing but deceit and disaster. Those who know a mother's heart will easily guess that Elizabeth of Poland was no sooner aware of the danger that threatened her son than she travelled to Naples. Arriving there before her coming was suspected. Rumors spread abroad that the Queen of Hungary had come to take her son away with her, and the unexpected event gave rise to strange comments. The fever of excitement now blazed up in another direction. The Empress of Constantinople, the Catanese, her two daughters, and all the courtiers whose calculations were upset by André's departure hurried to honor the arrival of the Queen of Hungary by offering a very cordial and respectful reception, 
with a view to showing her that, in the midst of a court so attentive and devoted, any isolation or bitterness of feeling on the young prince's part must spring from his pride, from an unwarrantable mistrust, and his naturally savage and untrained character. Joan received her husband's mother with so much proper dignity in her behavior that in spite of preconceived notions, Elizabeth could not help admiring the noble seriousness and earnest feelings she saw in her daughter-in-law. To make the visit more pleasant to an honored guest, fetes and tournaments were given, the barons vying with one another in display of wealth and luxury. The Empress of Constantinople, the Cantonese, Charles of Dura, and his young wife all paid the utmost attention to the mother of the prince. Marie, who, by reason of her extreme youth and gentleness of character, had no share in any intrigues, was guided quite as much by her natural feeling as by her husband's orders, when she offered to the Queen of Hungary those marks of regard and affection that she might have felt for her own mother. In spite, however, of these protestations of respect and love, Elizabeth of Poland trembled for her son, and obeying a maternal instinct, chose to abide by her original intention, believing that she should never feel safe until André was far away from a court in appearance so friendly, but in reality so treacherous. The person who seemed most disturbed by the departure, and tried to hinder it by every means in his power, was Friar Robert. Immersed in his political schemes, bending over his mysterious plans with all the eagerness of a gambler who is on the point of gaining, the Dominican who thought himself on the eve of a tremendous event, who by cunning, patience, and labor hoped to scatter his enemies and to reign as absolute autocrat, now falling suddenly from the edifice of his dream, stiffened himself by a mighty effort to stand and resist the mother of his pupil. But fear cried too loud in the heart of Elizabeth for all the reasonings of the monk to lull it to rest. To every argument he advanced, she simply said that while her son was not king and had not entire unlimited power, it was imprudent to leave him exposed to his enemies. And the monk, seeing that all was indeed lost, and that he could not contend against the fears of this woman, asked only the boon of three days' grace, at the end of which time, should a reply he was expecting not have arrived, he said he would not only give up his opposition to André's departure, but would follow himself, renouncing forever a scheme to which he had sacrificed everything. Towards the end of the third day, as Elizabeth was definitely making her preparations for departure, the monk entered radiant showing her a letter which he had just hastily broken open he cried triumphantly god be praised madame i can at last give you incontestable proofs of my active zeal and accurate foresight andre's mother after rapidly running through the document turned her eyes on the monk with yet some traces of mistrust in her manner not venturing to give way to her sudden joy yes madame said the monk raising his head his plain features lighted up by his glance of intelligence yes madame you will believe your eyes perhaps although you would never believe my words this is not the dream of an active imagination the hallucination of a credulous mind the prejudice of a limited intellect it is a plan slowly conceived painfully worked out my daily thought and my whole life's work i have never ignored the fact that at the court of avignon your son had powerful enemies but i knew also that on the very day i undertook a certain solemn engagement in the prince's name an engagement to withdraw those laws that had caused coldness between the Pope and Robert, who was in general so devoted to the Church. I knew very well that my offer would never be rejected, and this argument of mine I kept back for the last. See, madame, my calculations are correct. Your enemies are put to shame, and your son is triumphant. Then turning to André, who was just coming in and stood dumbfounded at the threshold on hearing these last words, he added, Come, my son, our prayers are at last fulfilled. You are king. King? repeated André, transfixed with joy, doubt, and amazement. King of Sicily and Jerusalem, yes, my lord. There is no need for you to read this document that brings the joyful, unexpected news. You can see it in your mother's tears. She holds out her arms to press you to her bosom. You can see it in the happiness of your old teacher. He falls on his knees at your feet to salute you by this title, which he would have paid for with his own blood had it been denied to you much longer. And yet, said Elizabeth, after a moment's mournful reflection, if I obey my presentiments, your news will make no difference to our plans for departure. Nay, mother, said André firmly, 
you would not force me to quit the country to the detriment of my honor if i have made you feel some of the bitterness and sorrow that have spoiled my young days because of my cowardly enemies it is not from a poor spirit but because i was powerless and knew it to take any sort of striking vengeance for their secret insults their crafty injuries and their underhand intrigues it was not because my arm wanted strength but because my head wanted a crown i might have put an end to some of these wretched beings the least dangerous maybe but it would have been striking in the dark the ringleaders would have escaped and i should never have really got to the bottom of their infernal plots so i have silently eaten out my own heart in shame and indignation now that my sacred rights are recognized by the church you will see my mother how these terrible barons the queen's counsellors the governors of the kingdom will lower their heads in the dust for they are threatened with no sword and no struggle no peer of their own is he who speaks but the king it is by him they are accused by the law they shall be condemned and shall suffer on the scaffold oh my beloved son cried the queen in tears i never doubted your noble feelings or the justice of your claims but when your life is in danger to what voice can i listen but the voice of fear what can move my counsels but the promptings of love mother believe me if the hands and hearts alike of these cowards had not trembled you would have lost your son long ago it is not violence that i fear my son it is treachery my life like every man's belongs to god and the lowest of spiri may take it as i turn the corner of the street but a king owes something to his people the poor mother long tried to bend the resolution of andre by reason and entreaties but when she had spoken her last word and shed her last tear she summoned bertram de beau chief justice of the kingdom and marie duchess of durazzo trusting in the old man's wisdom and the girl's innocence she commended her son to them in the tenderest and most affecting words then drawing from her own hand a ring richly wrought and taking the prince aside she slipped it upon his finger saying in a voice that trembled with emotion as she pressed him to her heart my son as you refuse to come with me here is a wonderful talisman which i would not use before the last extremity so long as you wear this ring on your finger neither sword nor poison will have power against you you see then mother said the prince smiling with this protection there is no reason at all to fear for my life there are other dangers than sword or poison sighed the queen be calm mother the best of all talismans is your prayer to god for me it is the tender thought of you that will keep me forever in the path of duty and justice your maternal love will watch over me from afar and cover me like the wings of a guardian angel elizabeth sobbed as she embraced her son and when she left him she felt her heart was breaking at last she made up her mind to go and was escorted by the whole court who had never changed towards her for a moment in their chivalrous and respectful devotion the poor mother pale trembling and faint leaned heavily upon andre's arm lest she should fall on the ship that was to take her from her son for ever she cast her arms for the last time about his neck and there hung a long time speechless tearless and motionless when the signal for departure was given her women took her in the arms half swooning and andre stood on the shore with the feeling of death at his heart his eyes were fixed upon the sail that carried ever farther from him the only being he loved in the world suddenly he fancied he beheld something white moving a long way off his mother had recovered her senses by a great effort and had dragged herself up to the bridge to give a last signal of farewell the unhappy lady knew too well that she would never see her son again at almost the same moment that andre's mother left the kingdom the former queen of naples robert's widow donna sancha breathed her last sigh she was buried in the convent of santa maria delta croce under the name of clara which she had assumed on taking her vows as a nun as her epitaph tells us as follows here lies an example of great humility the body of the sainted sister clara of illustrious memory otherwise sancha queen of sicily and jerusalem widow of the most serene robert king of jerusalem and sicily who after the death of the king her husband when she had completed a year of widowhood exchanged goods temporary for goods eternal adopting for the love of god a voluntary poverty and distributing her goods to the poor she took upon her the rule of obedience in this celebrated convent of santa croce the work of her own hands in the year of thirteen forty four on the gist of january of the twelfth indiction 
where, living a life of holiness under the rule of the blessed Francis, father of the poor, she ended her days religiously in the year of our Lord, 1345, on the 28th of July of the 13th indiction. On the following day she was buried in this tomb. The death of Dona Sancha served to hasten on the catastrophe which was to stain the throne of Naples with blood. One might almost fancy that God wished to spare this angel of love and resignation the sight of so terrible a spectacle, that she offered herself as a propitiary sacrifice to redeem the crimes of her family. End of chapter 3 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia